and um, and so I'm really it's a real privilege to have to have her with us. Um, just here really quickly because she has to dart back down the road again. It is Mother's Day after all. Um, so Donna, come on ahead. Uh, like there's more I could say, but I don't want to steal your introduction. But Father, thank you for Donna. Thank you for who she is. Thank you for her willingness to come and uh, and serve us in this way this morning. And so bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everybody. Uh, hello. Um, it's so good to be with you. And you know when people go and they, they just say that all the time, but genuinely, it, I have been so looking forward to this. Um, I've gotten to know Neil over the last couple of years through like church leader things and training and stuff. Uh, Neil talks about you guys with so much love. He loves you guys. But he talks about you like you really love each other as well. And I've just been feeling the love this morning. It's been great. So guys, listen, thank you for having me. I'm going to just make sure. Dipping in and out of chapters. I'm not actually going to read a solid passage, which isn't like me. Um, when, I, when Neil had said that you guys were doing the walk, pray, and walk, pray, talk stuff, that was birthed when I was walking around my area, East Belfast, over COVID with my wee boy in his wheelchair, walking and just looking at the stuff that was happening, you know, hearing the news headlines, the fear. And I was just walking and praying and going, oh God, no, no. And just being in the place, but being present to God and wanting more, you know, wanting more than the headlines were saying was going to happen, not knowing if more was possible or what was going to be, but just in that space. And so I put the stuff down um, and sent it out. It's gone out across the UK. So you guys are doing it and you're part of the people of God praying the same prayers over their local communities, which I just love. I am a big, big into unity. Um, so we're going to be dipping in and out of that. But when I was walking and praying, because um, that's what the thing is called, um, I was very conscious of what is my imagination for this place? What is my imagination for my family coming out of COVID? What's going to happen here? We have a disabled son whose services were completely shut down what was going to happen to my family? What was going to happen to my street? What was going to happen in this sector and all of these places that I love? Um, as I was thinking about it, coming to here today, this picture could not leave my mind. Um, picture of 1989, uh, Tiananmen Square in China. Um, in 1989, there were protests. Oh, cheers. Um, Protests from up against the Chinese government. Um, I don't know if I got that photo. Um, Coming, yeah, Tank Man. Have you seen that photo? It's kind of iconic, isn't it? 1989 protests against the Chinese government. This one wee man, like it looks like he's got a shopping bag, you know? Like, what was he thinking? What did he imagine was going to happen? standing in front of those tanks. What did he imagine was going to happen to him, to the crowd, to the government, to China? What was his dream? And actually often in these moments of social injustice, a society, a culture, a government, what people do isn't really going in to create something big and better. It's coming out of a, this is wrong, I've got to do something. And so he did it, and he activated. It's a human thing to imagine. It's, what, it's part of what we, who we are as image bearers. God has made us that way. We create and we construct out of our imagination. Um, Christians are called to have a prophetic imagination. It's not what we imagine, but it's what God has given us in his word, in the spirit, and this community to imagine together, who are we? What is Rich Hill going to be like? What is Gilnahirk, my little village, going to be like? What should it be like? What's wrong here? What do we want here? We're called as Christians to imagine. And that's what I wanted to put into the Walk, Pray, Walk, Pray talk. We're going to dip into the first few chapters of Acts, pulling out a few strands for us 
as to what, how we can have a prophetic imagination for the people and place that we inhabit here and now. Now, in chapter one, you kind of see the disciples, they have got a bit of an old imagination. They want something a wee bit new, but they're still so stuck. They can't see beyond everything that they've known. So Jesus, after the resurrection, says, spent 40 days teaching them about the kingdom of God. That's kind of what he taught about mostly when he was here with them on earth. And Acts chapter one, it's like the disciples, they're, they're reaching, but they're still stuck. And so they say to Jesus, yeah, you're back. You're talking about the spirit. The spirit's going to come on you and the Messiah like he came on David, like he came on Saul, like in the other kings. Are you going to restore the kingdom now? And for the kingdom for then was this earthly land with boundaries where the Messiah would have military might. He would get his army behind him and kind of up the Romans from the Jews. We're going to appoint another male leader. That's what Peter, they, they, they all start to do. They take Judas and they replace him with Matthias. That's what they're doing, kind of verses 12 onwards. This old imagination for what the kingdom was. And Jesus hears this, yeah, we're ready, we're ready, we're going to do something. But out of this old, stale imagination that had passed, and Jesus goes like, I roll. You're going to receive power from the Spirit, and you will be my witnesses. You will be witnesses to the king and his kingdom. Here in Jerusalem, Judea, the south, Samaria, the north, and all the ends of the earth. And to them, that meant the Roman Empire. That was all the ends of the earth there. Jesus says, no, the kingdom's not yours. It's not the way you imagine it. Imagine bigger. And the Spirit's going to come on you and you will have power to imagine and power to witness. And the Spirit did come then, we see chapter 2, um, with wind and with fire. You've sung about it this morning. You've longed for it. We've invited the Spirit to come. Um, and this first coming of the Spirit, Peter makes sense of it in two key speeches. I'm going to kind of dig into these. The first speech is, um, well, the second speech is the one we're going to do first. So verses 22 to 36. Really what Jesus is saying, is Peter is saying here, he's speaking out the truth, the reality that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord of heaven and earth. So Jesus of Nazareth, the human person that they knew who came from a place, the wee fella that grew up in that village, he now is Lord of heaven and earth. So verse 36 um, let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus of Nazareth, both Lord and Christ. That is your key for your, your second speech here. That's what Peter is doing to make sense of Pentecost. And here in his speech, he uses in verse 34, um, Psalm 110. And it's the most used Psalm in the New Testament about Jesus as Lord. It's used in, in nearly all of the, the letters that Paul writes to the different churches. And so Peter really here is saying, right, Jesus, he was the peasant, the carpenter's son, the illegitimate child, the scandal, the fisherman from the fishing village Galilee. And John chapter one, Nathaniel says, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. So he was a no one. He was a no one by any standards. He was crucified and buried at the hands of his own people. That guy there that we're talking about, he is now equal with, and he is the same as Yahweh, the unmentionable name, the Lord, and the Messiah, the chosen anointed king who had been promised for centuries. Now, this was like a massive mindset shift for the Jews. It was massive for Peter as well. And it's really interesting to see Peter change after Pentecost, like six weeks ago. So we're starting in another book, but often we don't remember that this is six weeks after he had been standing in the same streets of the same city, watching the same leaders commit Jesus to a Roman death. This is the same Peter, you know, the one who argues and fights over who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And he's like up going, I'll go and get the tents, you know, when they're up in the, the transfiguration. This is the same Peter who is going to cut off the soldier's ear. The same Peter who says to a teenage slave, and no, I don't know Jesus, in the same city. Now he is standing in those same streets six weeks later. And he hadn't had any new information given to him. 
since then. He hadn't had the podcast or, you know, the blog or the pep talk. But the spirit made sense of everything that he'd known. Everything Peter knew, every memory, every experience of Jesus, the things he'd seen Jesus do as he followed him around the place, all those memories stored up, the call he'd heard and followed the net, times and the Sermon on the Mount and all those other places, the verbal assent he'd given to who Jesus was in Matthew 16, you're the son of the living God, the anointed king. And in this Pentecost pouring out of the spirit into Peter, his whole person started to know in a different way. It was set on fire, it was illuminated and activated. And the gift of the spirit gave Peter this whole person knowing, experiencing, encountering, making sense that Jesus of Nazareth was Lord of heaven and earth. Peter was given the power to faith see. That's a prophetic imagination. He faith saw. Paul writes in Corinthians, he says, you can only say Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. He had his spiritual eyes opened. And he started to faith speak from the prophetic imagination that the Spirit had given him. And like he says in chapter 4, verse 20, I can only say what I've seen and heard. When he knows it, when he sees it in faith, all he can do is speak it in faith. He'd had this moment where he saw himself, he saw others, he saw God, he saw the world around him in a whole new lens of the kingdom. You don't get that from going to Bible college. You don't get that from reading books. You don't get that from listening to podcasts. All those things are good, but the spirit has got to illuminate it and activate it in us to give us the lens of the kingdom. And this is the prophetic imagination that each of us need and that we all need in our communities, that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, not a truth to believe, but a reality that I live in and that I can be different and that the world around me can be different. Our church, I do a lot of work with church and church leaders. We veer into that small imagination too, before the spirit came, the same as, as the disciples, that holds Jesus' reign as king, keeping it in my heart as to how I feel today. Or it's for a future judgment day when I go to heaven. And it's mixed up in Christendom power. I hear a lot of churches going, come on, let's get our power back here. Linking with Stormont and flags. Kingdom is here and it's now. Not in my heart. The reign of Christ is over heaven and earth. And it comes always, always, always from the marginal spaces and people of this world. Jesus is Lord over heaven and earth is not a statement of faith that is true and doctrinally pure, but it's real and it's invaded my reality and your reality today in this place, this week. And so in Acts chapter three, Peter and John, they, they go to pray in the temple. And I think they kind of go like you guys are going out in your prayer walks, you know, or walking to the shop or leaving your kids to school. They're, they're just going along their way. Like with a prophetic imagination, with this lens of the kingdom, they see in a different way. The spirit has made them come alive. And I think this is a wee bit like the end of Matthew when Jesus sends, all right, I'm going. It's over to you guys now. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, says Jesus. So you guys, as you go, go and call people into the kingdom and teach them what it means to live there. So they faith go and they faith see and they faith speak out of a spiritual authority that had been gifted and given to them in the spirit. Now, previously, these disciples hadn't seen people like this guy before as they were following around after Jesus Jesus saw the marginal person. He saw the disabled person. 
sitting or lying wherever he was. The disciples didn't see him. And actually the disciples shut down the voices of these kinds of people. But they go to the temple and at the beautiful gate, this temple, they see a man. They faith see this man. It says here in chapter three, he who had been lame, he couldn't walk from birth. I think there's a picture there, is there? A slide. Um, he, 40 years, and he was 40 years old, it says in chapter three. Um, and he probably had been there the whole time. I lived in Bangladesh and we saw people like this brought out to the, the doors of the mosques and the marketplaces every day, six in the morning, left there till 10 at night to see what alms they could collect, um, begging. Peter and John, they don't just see the man, they see the temple system and the religious system around the man. Because the reason so many people were in Jeru Jerusalem at this time, what, the reasons why the streets were full was because it was the second biggest festival, religious festival, in, in um, the Jewish faith. And every male who didn't have a disability had to come and celebrate. That was the only get out clause if you don't have a disability. And actually it wasn't just because oh, that's too much trouble for you, because you're unclean. Because obviously if you, your body is suffering, then your spirit has done something wrong and God's punishing you. And so there was a whole story about this man that's why he's at the outside of the gate and not on the inside with the other people. And Peter and John go, they faith see this man, they faith see the temple structure, and they faith see themselves, and they say, look at us. I think this, this passage is so interesting, Acts chapter 3. They get down beside him, look at us. This guy's eyes are probably on the ground, 40 years of being a no one. They don't even have the dignity to give other human beings eye to eye contact. A lack of imagination for who he was as a human being, as a man, as a 40 year old person. A lack of imagination for who he could be. Basically all he had to do was get enough to eat that day. I've done a bit of work with different organizations and the most concerning thing I hear of people who work with people in the margins is that they have lost an imagination for who they could be. They've lost a sense that they are image bearers of the living God and that he has a purpose and a plan and goodness for them. Peter and John, faith saw this man, faith saw the temple, faith saw the religious system, they faith saw God because they knew this was not what he had for this man. And they faith saw themselves as the ones who stood between heaven and earth with Jesus as their Lord as they proclaimed it. And they faith saw themselves as the connection between the throne room of heaven and the dusty, dirty ground where this man sat with his begging bowl. And they didn't even pray as we think of praying, God, this, there's a man here. There's a man sitting here and he's got a begging bowl. Did you know that? They just were present to God, present to the man. And they declared in the name of Jesus and their spiritual authority, get up and walk. And he did. They faith saw, faith went, faith spoke. And they declared in the name of Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. This is the prophetic imagination. Remember Tank Man? I don't know that he had the resources of heaven at his hand or the imagination of who God was. And as you walk around this community, the streets and the neighborhoods with these prayers in your hearts and in your mouths, do you go in your spiritual authority? Do you faith go? Do you faith see? And do you faith speak these words? What or who do you see that needs the kingdom restoration? And in, in, the, the WhatsApp, in, the, in the small group resource, I suggested the first week you started a WhatsApp group and you shared pictures because there's something really powerful about seeing together and sitting over a reality together. That's what sparks our imagination. When I was standing outside parks where kids were playing, taped up over COVID, that sparked me to pray, no, this is not right. There is damage coming here. When I stood outside businesses shut down, 
I was disturbed at the economic recession that was going to come out of this. Prayed and declared kingdom into it. So seeing together is really, really important. And maybe the question isn't, what do you see? What pictures are you putting into your WhatsApp? But how do you see them? Are you faith seeing the reality in front of you? Are you close enough to look into people's faces? Look at us. Look at us. How do they see you? What will they see in your face? You're close enough to see the systems around individuals that affect and restrict their lives. Are you faith speaking? When we say amen, that's a together. We agree on this, God, let it be so. My daughter was like, why does that song, The Blessing, have so many amen, 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 amen? Amen means you're finished talking to God. like, you know, over and out, Yahweh. I said what every mother did over homeschooling. Go and Google that and find out. <laughs> Give me five more minutes, please. And she was like, oh, that actually means we agree. It means, God, let it be so, because we are in agreement over this. And where two or three are gathered in your name, then it will become. You need to ask the Spirit for his promised power of faith, sight, and faith, speech. Going back to the first speech of Peter, he makes sense of Pentecost power through Joel's prophecy in verses 14 to 21 of chapter 2. He uses Joel chapter 2, and he promised one day that when the Spirit was poured out, he would be poured out on all flesh, not 12 Jewish male older leaders who would govern and lead the new Israel, as the first disciples thought, but all flesh will see and speak the kingdom. Sons and daughters, that's men and women. Young men and old men, that's across generations. That's those we taught you've just sent up to the room there. Servants across social class division. And then in chapter 10, this was extended to Gentiles, people outside the sacred faith. Remember, Cornelius was given the vision first in chapter 10. And it's important that we know this was the first Jewish festival of weeks. Or that this, this is why people were in Jerusalem. The first fruits. And this is where they kind of went, and in an agricultural age, this is, we did this in Bangladesh, people did this all the time. They would come and say, oh, And so they would say, the rice has come up. So we're giving thanks. That was the first bit. It meant it's going to be okay. We're going to have a harvest this year. We don't really deal with that when we've got Tesco supermarkets on our doorstep. You know, there's no tomatoes. We're raging, you know. But this is a reality for people. And so this was the festival. And so a little bit had come up. And so we know for sure this is going to be the harvest at the end. And this is exactly what the Spirit is doing. He's using this festival and he's saying, right, the Spirit has come. What do we see in Jerusalem? A multitude of voices declaring in the Spirit who God is and what he's done from Jews who'd gathered across the region. It says every nation under heaven and a shared language and a shared song that made sense to everybody. This is the reality. And so if you know the Bible and you know the end of the story, you'll go to Revelation 7 where humanity of the new heaven and earth was a great multitude that nobody could number from every nation tribe tongue language standing before the throne crying out with one voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and so here in jerusalem we've got the first fruits of something that's going to come and i didn't expect this but we're experiencing it this morning with a qr code you know Everybody being able to speak and engage with one language. It's amazing. And so what the Spirit was doing here was creating a new humanity that was broken in the fall and was broken and dispersed in Genesis 11 with Babel. God separated people because they were starting to just care about themselves and build cities and build empires. God said, no, you are to go out and cultivate and create wide grassroots and so he dispersed them in, in Genesis 11 and so what's happening in Pentecost is a reversal of of the fallenness of our humanity the church here often just talks about the gospel dealing with the division between me as an individual and God but what was broken in Genesis 3 was my relationship with you humanity has been broken there are social divisions that are rife 
You just need to look at the headlines and look at history. And so at Pentecost, the Spirit comes and gives us power to be one again in a whole new way. This united new humanity, a new community, a new society where Jesus is Lord over heaven and earth. And we are all, despite our divisions, rewriting oppression and injustice in here. In a world that's dominated by individualism, I'll define me, I'm who I want to be, and I just consume what I want when I want. In a world desperately trying to make sense of equality and diversity and inclusion without God's order, the Spirit has done it. Acts chapter 2. We are just called to live it out. And so look at the church in Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, and then in chapter 4 and 32 also. And this is repeated, the rest of Acts. And it's repeated in all the different letters that Paul writes to the different churches as they kind of grew and consolidated. All who believed were together. They had all things in common. And in chapter 4, verse 32, they were of one heart and soul. That's repeated a lot about the early church. And no one wanted to own anything himself but to share everything. And there was nobody in any need among them. Paul writes to the church 69% of the time that he says the word you, it means usins. It's not an instruction for me. I don't read this and go, oh. it's a usins, guys. Usins. This is how to live. This oneness took a lot of time. It took teaching. And so in all the letters, if you take every single letter, you will see Paul talking about, you're one, you're one, you're one. Why are you not living it out? So in 1 Corinthians 11, he's writing and saying, guys, you see this Lord's Supper thing? It was given for you to be one. Why are you celebrating it with the rich people here with food and the poor people down there with none? Go and do it properly. When he writes to Philemon, to say, listen, this, this slave Onesimus who ran away stole from you. He didn't ask Philemon to take him back because just to be kind to the wee poor slave, you know. He was like, guys, you're one. Go and figure it out. Not having this. In Ephesus, First Timothy, he writes to a group, the church there, where there was a group of women, uber feminists, and they were dominating the conversation. And Paul says, uh-uh, no, you tone your voice down because you're one. And all these other letters, you're one. Our oneness takes training. And so this power-saturated community submitted themselves to practices to form them into oneness. The practices that are talked about here in chapter 2, the apostles' teaching, breaking of bread, the fellowship, prayer and praise, sharing material things, they're for our formation, our reshaping in two ways. Our shaping into the kingdom, it's not my way, it's God's way. Jesus is my Lord, Lord of heaven and earth, and is submitting to one another. Paul says, you submit to one another as unto Christ. That's what it means to be the body. That's what it means to be this new humanity. I often do training for churches, and I like to get a wee picture of them off their Facebook or off their website, and I'll put it up and I'll say, what are you, what are you doing? And they kind of go, I don't know. That's what we do in church. Churches just often just keep doing the things that they've always done, that they grew up doing, that were handed from that generation to that generation. And actually getting verbs. Well, we're singing, we're gathering, we're praying, we have teaching, we've got kids, we're having coffee. Having those names is actually quite hard for people to do because they just do things that they've always done. And then I say, well, how, on a scale of one to ten, is your singing forming you into oneness? How is your teaching forming you into togetherness and your koinonia ness in the church? These guys here in Acts 2, they were sold out to the community. No one wanted anything for himself. Everybody was for the kingdom and for the community of the kingdom. And that is not the, the story in the rooms that I sit in with church leaders, especially coming out of covid where everybody's kind of changed church because I didn't really get much out of that church. You know, I didn't really get much out of that this morning. 
that was not the line of direction. It was me to this community, not this community to me. It was not the priority. And so in this community, this multiplicity of voices from different backgrounds, like look at them in chapter 5, verse 14. They've got men and women, and they're very, very uh, clearly stating that here in chapter 5, verse 14. You've got people who've been healed, people like this lame man coming in, like their story, their background into this space, slaves and slave owners. Um, it was this hodgepodge community all together. And the Spirit caused people to utter, Jesus is Lord over heaven and earth. Now, when the early church began, baptism, that was your initiation into this community and the faith, all the people had to say was, Jesus is Lord. That was it. That was your bottom line. We're one. Jesus Christ is Lord. Because it was a costly thing to say. And in baptism, the early Christians, they went down into the water together naked. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that. But this is how they practiced it. Because they knew we've got to take robes and rags off these people. We've got to take the rings and the ropes. Because they are one. They are the same. It was a leveler. To say Jesus is Lord leveled the community. And so there was a recognition at this point that if I'm saying Jesus is Lord and you're saying Jesus is Lord, but I make you call me Lord, then how does that figure out? When we say together Jesus is Lord, we change each other and how we relate. And then when we say Jesus is Lord together and we start to change each other, we start to change society. So Philemon, who shared baptism with Onesimus and said, Jesus is Lord together. When Onesimus goes back to him, Philemon knows that my other neighbors who have the big houses and loads of slaves, they are going to be wanting me to beat this guy to a pulp. Otherwise, their slaves are going to think they can steal and run away and it'll be grand. And so he knew there's a cost to living out this oneness and this equality. Same happened with Jews and Greeks. The same happened with males and females. A new social order was created in this community that the watching world saw and thought, huh. And they reacted in two ways. Either, yeah, that looks good. I want to be part of that. Or, I am not losing my power here. And so I'll crush this new kind of community. And this spirit-empowered witness, this prophetic imagination that came from a community and how they lived together was like Tank Man standing from his imagination in front of the whole system and society and structures of brokenness and injustice. What does that prophetic imagination of oneness look like for you guys? This spirit-empowered witness that's so needed by the world from the church, but the church are so individualistic and consuming of church. They fail to be able to deliver this witness. And we're so paternalistic about how we do behave across social divisions. We're so them and us often about doing food banks, doing drop-ins for people seeking asylum, disability, mental health. We're so paternalistic and power-centric about global mission. We're going to save the rest of the world when actually 60% of the global church exists in the rest of the world and we need to hear their voice. What does it look like not just to do a food bank for two hours and feel like we're the good people who do kind things to poor people, but to create a whole new community where the need for food banks is actually diminishing in this, in this part of the world? And we change the system not just because of the policies, but because of our community where nobody had any need. The Spirit, says John in his gospel, the Spirit of truth will lead you into truth. And so when I was praying for you guys and coming, that verse, the Spirit is who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, was really strong for me with that tame and square picture. Because when the Spirit comes, he is going to convict the world, says John in chapter 16, about sin because they don't confess Jesus as Lord of heaven and earth. That's the bottom line for all sin personally and structurally. He's going to convict the world about righteousness because going to the Father, heavenly throne, where we want the things on earth to be the way they are in heaven. 
and he's going to convict the world about judgment because the enemy has been defeated and wrong will be made right one day. Tom Wright says, the genuine spirit work is not this private moment with Jesus, this Pentecostal um, encounter just internally, but it's public because he will convict the world. He will prove the world is wrong. He will show up at standards as bogus and bring it to judgment and make everything that is wrong right one day. That is the imagination that we're going for. We are different to Tank Man because we know there is a plan and a purpose to make things good again. And today, the Spirit will do this all, not with us as the church being flies on walls, but in us and through us and through our communities who love a place and are committed to a place and are faith-seeing, faith-speaking, and faith going with their spiritual authority to bring transformation. Our prophetic imagination cuts clearly into and calls for radical transformation within every cultural ideology, every societal structure, every community issue, and every personal life experience. We just need to turn up, tune in, and join with what God is doing. The early followers overcame, it says in Revelation, through the blood of the Lamb, the word of their witness, and that they didn't love their own lives until death. You want the power of resurrection as you walk around this community. Do you want it? The power of the resurrection will only come through the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Do you want that? We witness to the king in the way of the king, whose crown was made of thorns, whose throne was a cross, and who reaches into this rich hill community with a blood-stained hand in the dusty corners of the earth. Guys, do you want to be part of that faith movement of the kingdom? The faith go, faith see, faith speak this week. Do you want to be part of this new humanity to give up your me, myself, and I for a beautiful guy, we and us? His promised power will come upon you. Comes where he's wanted. And you will be his witnesses this way. So we say together, Jesus, you are Lord over heaven and this patch of the earth. We say yes to you, our king, and we say yes to you, our kingdom among us. And we, with fearful trembling, say yes to the way your kingdom comes. Give us faith to see, faith to go, faith to speak, and faith to live together in the power of your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We so very much need you to witness your kingdom this week. Amen.